Today is Monday, uh, July 13th, 2020. My name is Ezekiel Medina. I'm interviewing you, Christina Martinez, for the Rutgers Latino New Jersey History Project and the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Mrs. Christi Christina Martinez, that this interview, audio video files, and transcript will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin and the Rutgers Oral History Archives. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or discuss, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you would like to discuss, please make sure to bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record your verbal consent as well as the consent or deed of gift that I emailed you for Rutgers. Voces wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin and the Rutgers Oral History Archives. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Voces. So I need your response to these three questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree, after each one. The first, do you give Voces consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? And yes, I do agree. <clears throat> do you grant Voces copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes, I do agree. And do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I do agree. Okay, okay so we can begin. All right, um, so Christina first, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you go about becoming a nurse um, or maybe if you want to start before that, where is your family from and how did you arrive to Florida in this way? Sure. Um, so very humble roots. I'm first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to have this conversation and um, to share my story. But um, very humble story. Uh, I have both parents are from the Caribbean. So I have my mother is from Dominican Republic, uh, born and raised there as a young child, immigrated here to uh, New York City uh, with her family living the uh, American dream. They grew up in uh, the projects of New York City. And my father uh, was born in New York City, but family is originally from Puerto Rico. So um, my parents met in New York City back in the 70s. And uh, my dad joined the Air Force at, in 1977. And um, <clears throat> they relocated to Florida and I was born in uh, Eglin Air Force Base here in Florida. But with that being said and told, uh, we lived all over the world. We, 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 we lived you know, in Europe, we lived in uh, upstate uh, New York or in the Northern region, of, um, Northeast region of United States and the South as well. And I came to Florida due to um, just a change in atmosphere to come and work as a nurse. And um, I've been living here for about 15 years or so, 17 years. So um, I moved here in 2001 and then 9-11 happened. That's how I remember my move to New I mean, to Florida. <laughs> Um, and so would you say that because your father was in the military that kind of helped you decide to do that or how did you go about finding this route? So I would say yes. Um, I lived, I was a military brat my entire life from birth until about, until my dad retired for 20 years. That's all I knew was that lifestyle and engaging with different people and cultures. Um, so I don't know what it's like to live in one particular place um, and one culture because in the military you deal with so many different backgrounds and that's the beauty of, of, of the military and it, it builds a resilience. So um, I was really intrigued by that lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> I decided to do uh, military nursing I mean, it started back in 2003 with the story, you know, I was telling my, my friend last night, I said, you know, she says, well, why, why the military nursing? I said, you know, I went to a conference um, in Orlando and I met this military nurse there, a major in the army. 
And she says, she's explaining this entire world of military nursing in the operating room. And I was just so taken back and just so, it just moved me. And I said, I got to do this. I, this is what I want to do. It's a higher purpose for me. And um, I, I didn't look at that at the time in 2003, you're talking about the height of the war. Um, things, a lot of things were going on in this country with that area. And at the time um, I was finishing up my associate's degree, my bachelor's degree. So I didn't have the education I needed to go into the military um, as a registered nurse and that, you know, starting a family and life just takes a different pattern. And then um, the Navy found me uh, one day uh, through uh, social media on my uh, business account. And they said, hey, <laughs> you know, you're a nurse. Would you like to join the Navy? I said, well, I, I, you know, I think I'm a little too old for the Navy. I think I'm too old for the military. I said, no, 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 come and join. And, you know, I did my research, did my homework, and um, I don't regret it at all. So that's how I landed into the Navy as a registered nurse. That's amazing. Um, so when did you first hear about COVID then? Where were you and how did you hear about it? So COVID, the story with COVID is very tricky, I think for all of us. Um, I was here in my hometown, Tampa Bay, and um, I work as a nurse in the local hospitals, okay? And COVID still wasn't prevalent here. It was something you heard about overseas. And one of my friends was supposed to go to a conference in California. I'll never forget this, this was back in February. And my girlfriend says, you know, we got this big nursing conference in California. I had two friends that were going. And there were still like, people were getting sick in California. Nobody knew what this was, you know? And my friend goes, you know, I don't know. I don't feel right about going. I don't think I'm gonna go, I'm gonna cancel my trip. I said, really, you're a genie, you're gonna cancel your trip? And she's, yeah, this doesn't look right. I think, I think this is really bad. This is, this is, I, I don't think this is gonna be good. And, and of course, we didn't know enough still. This is before Seattle became the hot spot. And um, I said, wow, this is, maybe it will, it will fade away like a lot of viruses do. And I was very naive with that. And then um, I started an, um, an internship here with some new nurses and COVID started coming to Florida. And I started to see the changes in my community with COVID. I started to see a lot of fear in the healthcare provider, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, questioning themselves because it was just unknown. And um, you can sense the fear in the hospitals. And that's what, when I first found what was COVID and it was still very unknown. You know, we didn't know how to take care of the patient. We didn't, we didn't know what was the actual equipment to wear. Um, so it was, it, I saw my first COVID patient here was a rule out COVID patient. They broke their uh, wrist. And um, of course the hospital was like high alert with this patient in Tampa, first patient. And, um, and I just remember everyone just being very quiet. It reminded me very much of any kind of natural disaster when people just don't know what to say. So when did, so would you say that when you got your first patient, it like solidified for you that this was really happening? Absolutely. It solidified it. And what really was the take home was um, my company, my hospital made us wear masks inside the hospital and they took our temperature. And that's when it really became a, oh my, this is real. This is, this is really happening. Mm -hmm. So, um, so take, tell me a little bit about what would be a typical day at the hospital then, um, given this pandemic. Well, I guess not typical, but <laughs> what was um, a general flow and also how often did protocols change? So before COVID, you have um, normal standard of care. We practice best practice. We uh, follow um, FDA, uh, nursing research, uh, government um, standards of care, joint commission, gold standards of care, uh, the WHO, 
you know, we, we really use our um, best practices in, re in medicine and nursing, okay? When COVID came, we still tried it to follow that. But then it was like, um, it, as COVID came, you start to see a lot of, like I said, fear come in. So then you start to see um, supplies diminish faster. Those supplies are essential to what we do in order to take care of our patient every day. And so once you start seeing supplies, like basic things leaving and you don't have it, it heightened even more anxiety. It just shot it up for a lot of individuals. Like, I can't do this. Oh my God, I don't have, I don't have this and this and that. Where's all this? And then, you know, the company's like, okay, okay, we're going to order more. Don't worry. And then they couldn't, it was like, it wasn't available. And I think that's when a lot of questions and uncertainty from the healthcare provider came through. You start to see ingenuity, innovation, because they were used to the normal. And now they're like, wow, okay, let me think about this approach. How did I do this before? And what is my new way of doing this to keep the patient safe and to keep the standard of care, okay? And that's what we've started to see in um, this COVID process as it started becoming more and more invasive in our, in our world of healthcare. So what are some of the ways that um, y'all innovated or use your ingenuity? Like what, what do you think of one of the clever, what are one of the cleverest things that you've seen? So um, I work in surgery, I work in the operating room. And um, at the time they were saying that this disease was aerosolized when a patient was intubated because again, a lot of unknown. And so anesthesiologists were formulating um, methods of how to intubate <clears throat> um, a patient without exposing or minimal exposure. So they were um, using like negative air pressure or intubating a patient in an area before bringing them into an, an, an area that is a positive air pressure where it means that the air blows down and can expose patients everywhere. Um, also, they were um, intubating or they would intubate a patient with N95s um, or their PAPR masks. And um, they would have the team that was not, if there was extra people in the room, step out of the room and let the room clear out, air handle, clear the room for about 15 minutes and then come in to start the surgery. Um, you also saw using like tents, they would take... Um, <laughs> drapes that we use to cover surgical sites and tent a patient and then kind of go under and intubate them and see an airway with like a camera. I mean, these guys were, they were, it was a race against time. It's a race against time. That, that is a lot. Um, I think what, so you said that there was a lot of fear in the hospital. How, how are people managing that? Like how are your fellow nurses, your coworkers, your nurse assistants, how, how doctors, how was everybody coping with this? I, to be honest, everyone is unique in their own coping mechanism. I do know my organization and I have to say every health organization has processes in place to help um, individuals get through this. Um, they have counseling chaplains, there's um, uh, pastoral care that were constantly motivating. They were rounding on the nurses. Um, I know that the CNOs, CEOs, um, financial analysts for the companies would write emails and they would just, you know, try to be there to words of encouragement um, to help the morale. And um, even as we're in this hour in Florida, the morale, you know, they're still trying to keep the up tempo of that because it is very uh, stressful. It is a very stressful um, environment. So um, that you can't really escape. So that's why they call it a warfare because you just can't like, like, oh, let me, <laughs> let me walk to the corner and it doesn't, it's not here. No, you're kind of like in it, like you're in it <laughs> and um, you don't leave it even when you leave the hospital because it's in the community and then you start seeing the community um, the way it is. Um, being very quiet and somber. So it's a very sad cycle all around. Okay. Um, so when did you first learn that you would be heading to New York? 
or you would be deployed. And can you explain to me about what that process is? <laughs> that is the most famous question I get. I'm going to be very honest because this was the most unique situation that this country has faced um, next to Pearl Harbor um, because it was, it was just one of those things we didn't expect to happen on our territory. So I will say that um, around March 27th, I got, no, excuse me, March 24th, I got a phone call. And it started with a phone call. And the phone call was from my commanding officer and um, Commander Lau. And he calls me and, you know, he, he calls me, there's a voice message. I text him back and he says, no, you need to call me. <laughs> I said, okay. So he calls, I call back and he says, you know, um, Lieutenant Martinez, how are you? And I said, good. It's kind of unusual, sort of get a call from you. I'm in the middle of work. How can I help you? He says, well, um, I have to read you um, your deployment statement. Okay. I said, okay. I took a deep breath and I listened and I, you know, I take breaths whenever I'm in a crisis or in a code so I can concentrate on what the words are and the actions are. And he read it and he says, any questions for me? And, I, and he goes, but I don't know where we're going, when we're leaving, how long we're going. And I, my only question was, well, what do I pack? <laughs> um, what kind of boots do I wear? <laughs> Cause I have many sets. I said, is this land or sea? is this field or hospital and he couldn't even answer and i said okay i'm just gonna you know prepare for the worst here and then um and then they had meetings with the admiral um am amazing communication we had from the white house and um i mobilized with um emf bethesda which is the helm of the president's hospital and um, they're in washington and um, the chain of command, even Admiral Riggs was on the call and was very assuring. I mean, the words, the words she used during the hour of the call, because you knew, she knew there was so much anxiety on that call. I mean, she had, there was like over, I think three or 400 people on the call from across the nation. We all got the call and we we're all on the line. And she's, her words gave me goosebumps because she says, you know, this is, this is unprecedented times and this is the darkest hour, but you are going to be doing the most important work for our citizens. And she goes, I wish I could tell you that things are going to be okay, but you have to be brave. And I said, oh my, this is real. We are really going to go into this. And I was still in a fog. I just felt like Oh my, I, I, I can't, like my hometown is also facing this, but I don't even know, like the horrors I've heard on the news and the media, I'm just like, oh my, this is going to be interesting. I don't know if I'm ready, but that's why we do what we do. You have to have courage. So when did you finally find out or when were you finally briefed that this was your end location or did you just go and so I didn't find out I was going to New York City because they were telling us well we can go to Seattle go to Texas uh New Orleans also at that time was really in bad shape they were escalating and um and uh and uh all of a sudden <laughs> <laughs> I get an email saying orders to NYC. That's how I found out. I said, oh, we are going to the epicenter. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so before we talk about getting to New York, the what were some of your feelings or thoughts about having to leave your family um, and be deployed? Um, and how, how did you go about um, coping with that? So one thing I will share, at the same time that I got the call, so did my husband. My husband um, is National Guard for the state of Florida. And um, he was activated as well, same time frame. 
and um, they were going to be in Miami. Because Miami at the time, the, the cases were rising. And um, not as much as New York, but I believe they were up there like as New Orleans, because it's a condensed area, highly populated. And um, I remember having this call and wondering with my three children, it's like, wow, um, okay, both parents mobilizing at the same time, which is very unheard of, very uncommon, but there is a risk of that. So um, emotions and thoughts going through my, myself was I was thinking of my children first and their safety and making sure I had everything in place. Um, I wasn't necessarily worried about me um, because I, we train for mental toughness. We train for resilience. Um, I was looking forward towards the challenge. Um, but I was not looking for, toward, forward towards my children having to miss both parents. So, um, but when I left, I left them without crying. I left them, um, you know, telling them I would be back, that I'm going to be in New York, um, and that their dad's in Miami. Um, and I think it was just the unknown was the biggest fear factor in my mind. It's like, wow, okay. But you have to, you have to have some kind of belief in something in order to get through anything. So I just, I just held on to that faith. So you entered New York. Um, if this is happening end of March, it was really bad here. <laughs> um, so what was that very first, what was it like upon your arrival? <laughs> so when we flew out, when I flew out of Florida, we landed in Philadelphia. From Philadelphia, they bused us to New Jersey, um, Fort Dix, McGuire Air Force Base. There, it's like midnight. I can't even tell you what time. It was a long day. <laughs> um, the, the airport in Philadelphia was completely empty. And Philadelphia is a, I mean, it's a massive, it's, it's a city. It, it's a city. And so there was like nobody there except those of us in the Navy that flew in. And I was like, oh my, oh my, kind of took my breath away. I've never seen anything like that and it was super clean. <laughs> and then um, we get to Fort Dix and it's dark. And of course, you know, you're trying to adjust to your element and the debriefing from the, you know, army was, so we're dealing battling COVID-19. This is the invisible enemy. Up, uh, I think the state of New York at that time, I had already close to 8,000 deaths. And they're recording about 900 deaths a day. And I just sat there <laughs> like, oh my, 900 people a day, a day. And I thought, oh, this is real. This is very real. Um, so that was my introduction to New York City. Um, and we were also driving in with the Army Morgue of Engineers um, with the, with the, with the um, Medical Corps, with the Navy um, buses into New York. And the streets were completely empty in New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey. Um, once you hit um, George Washington Bridge, there was not a car, only service trucks on the road. It was eerie, very eerie. That gave me goosebumps, actually. <laughs> and I lived here and saw that, but to hear that, because I, I haven't been in the area of New York in months um, since the beginning of this. And, and I used to intern in Newark all the time. I used to take the train. I was taking the train until March 9th. <laughs> and things were coming from New York every day. So it was, it was a scary time, but I never got to see everything shut down like that, only my area. But I heard that when people saw cities empty, it really hit something different because you, you realize that, like, you, you can know it's real, but then you see it's real and it becomes an actualized thing. 
Okay, so um, when you arrived to New York City, where did they place you initially um, there? So when we arrived in New York City, um, it all looked very familiar to me because as a child, I, you know, I have family that lives in New York City, Manhattan. And so I knew we crossed over, we landed on the east side, but we went over to the west side. And I said, oh, okay, we're going to the west side of Manhattan here. And we went to an area called Hell's Kitchen. And it was, again, completely empty, empty. And when I looked out my window on the bus, all I saw were um, military uniforms on the street. And I was like, wow, it was like hard to wrap my head. There was no cars on the street. Like New York City had no cars on the street, no taxis, no people. And I, I just, I said, oh my. So we ended up staying in Hell's Kitchen, which was about, uh, what, four blocks, I think, from um, Javits Center. But also it was in the center of the helm of where we would service out the 11 city hospitals to New York City, um, the county hospitals. Um, so I wanna ask about your lodging situation, if you can talk about it. Like, where did they place you, where'd you stay? Uh, besides Hell's Kitchen, something more specific. Did you put you in a hotel or in like dorms or something? Uh, we stayed in um, hotels. FEMA had purchased a bunch of hotels because they were empty. Nobody was staying in no hotel. <laughs> so um, they had like Doubletree, Hyatt, um, Holiday Inn, uh, the Renaissance, whatever hotels were within that perimeter there. And um, that was very odd too because you it, it reminded me something from like old wars of past movies um because the military was in this hotel and you had a few of the team members that worked in the hotel working and helping us getting his rooms and we're all in uniform and big bags and one image that never left my head was um the guide on Bethesda came in, a guide on is, is our, is our, is our flag, is our post, is our, is our, is an announcement in our unit. So every military unit has a guide on. And this guide on was already placed in the hotel, meaning we took over, we are here. And that means a lot. That's a big deal. It's like, you know, boom, this is our property. And I saw that guide on in the corner of the hotel and it was just like, wow, we really took over this hotel. <laughs> it was weird and people would walk by and like it's like all military in there it, it just reminded me something like of like like the pacific in world war ii or like you know the civil war you know where they were where um soldiers would take over homes or um live in residences that don't normally host people you know it, it was very different <laughs> Was there anything that you were expecting? I'm not sure you could even have expectations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so since you are initially, or your family's initially from New York, what was that like coming back during this particular moment for you? It was very eerie um, because I've walked those streets before. My dad used to work, okay, so, we were near Times Square, we're near 34th Street, we're on 39th and 7th and 8th, so we're in Garment District area, and uh, my friends and I had to go to the store, and I'm walking around, and my dad, my dad used to work at the McDonald's off of 34th Street. <laughs> okay, this is how near home it is for me, and um, there was a point where I think there was like four of us walking, and we were the only four people on the sidewalk, on the street in an alley and I'm just like this is so weird this is so weird my friends were able to take pictures like you know usually when you go to New York City you can't take a picture because everyone's like in your way no not here they were able to take pictures of Madison Square Garden of Macy's of um, Times Square Garment District I mean they had like they were like oh look look the building Empire City Building I can take a picture of it <laughs> and um it felt like 
a bad dream. I felt, I felt like I was in some kind of like apocalypse movie. It was just, I mean, I'm in full uniform, walking around broad daylight, nobody on the street. I think there was like a couple cops. And if people were walking the street, they had masks on and they would, you know, stop and they, you know, they want to take a picture with us or, oh my God, thank you for coming. And you're, you're like, oh, you know, you're kind of like, you don't want to engage too much. And, um, and you see people looking out their window at you. And it was just weird. It was just different. I wouldn't say weird, but just different. It, <laughs> it was unlike anything that's ever happened before. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so um talk to me a little bit about the your briefing about going to javits um and that field hospital mm -hmm. and just your initial experience and what they were telling you to expect so when we get there of course it's kind of chaotic when i get to new york and you know we drop our bags and we're like okay meet us downstairs we're gonna go to javits and i had just only heard of javits i'm like i don't even know what this javits is <laughs> um i happened to google it <laughs> and and they were like oh they built a field hospital and i'm like oh okay i didn't even know this okay so um everyone had to go everyone everyone that was there everyone army air force navy all reported to javits because that's why i guess where they were just trying to launch the mission from and uh, we get there and um there's a ton of paparazzi i mean media is just everywhere the cameras, the zoom cameras, those long ones you see, <laughs> and you hear and you see the lights and you hear the ch -ch -ch and the flashing. I mean, it was just so built up. I, I mean, I'm like, I'm just here to do a job. It, it's just like all these reporters, it was overwhelming. Um, we get there and it's like you walk into this conference and it's like huge, it's overwhelming. And you're like, wow, where, th this is kind of bizarre. Like your mind is still trying to put these pieces together. And they're like, okay, congregate over here. And we were debriefed by the army, um, the ninth medical group. And I hope I'm saying they're right. And they came from Fort Hood, Texas, active duty. And um, they took over the mission or were leading the mission and were giving the assignments out based on what the needs of New York were at the time from Governor Cuomo and um, Mayor de Blasio. And um, <clears throat> we pretty much were there to service the needs of New York, no matter what it was. And um, the debrief was, you know, welcome, you're here. Um, here's what the game play by play will be. Um, EMF Bethesda, as we were all there standing there, you will be working in Javits and said, okay. Uh, nurses expect to have 16 patients per nurse. We can hold 3,000 uh, citizens in this building. And they already were at capacity of 1,000. And this was only April 6th. <laughs> they had just finished building the place. I mean, and they already were taking in patients. So the nurses, um, the Fort, uh, the Fort Hood group was already there, boots on ground working when we got there. Um, and we were there within a day, 20, plugged in that night. Matter of fact, that day we got there, some worked that night shift to coming in. Mm -hmm. So I know that um, nursing hours are usually like 12 hour shifts. Was it the same for this situation or was it a little bit of an adapted schedule? It was a, at the Javits Center, it was adaptive schedule. So um, it was pretty much fitting the needs of the mission. And, and, it, and, and it pretty much meant um, that entirety. So if you are a nurse, no matter what your specialty is, you will be working as a nurse. If you are a doctor, no matter if you are a surgeon <laughs> or um, an in, uh, internal medicine doc, you'll be working as a doctor. And um, our shifts ran 12 hours, but we were, you were really working over a 12 hour day because you had to, <clears throat> you know, get there, change, don the PPE, which was very rigorous. 
um, by the time you got off, you're looking at a 13, 14 hour day um, of working in a strenuous environment. And every, it was Monday, it was every day. It was not just three days a week, what most people are used to. It was every day you were working that shift. Um, and what was the PPE like? Um, it was so rigorous and, and did it change? So the PPE, um, it didn't really change. Um, we wore um, a gown, whether it was plastic or, or um, paper, you had gloves, you had um, the N95 that they provide with a surgical mask over it and your goggles and a hair cover. Um, the government was very, very um, well prepared for us to be taking care of this patient population. And they had these stations when you walked in, um, it was like a line. And so, you know, you would have someone um, spray your hands with a disinfectant that the state of New York had created and um you'd wash your hands and then you would put there was steps there was an organized step and someone would remind you if you didn't follow that step like no no no, you gotta do this and then wash your hands so um and even taking off the ppe was the same exact way very methodological very cautious um because we didn't want to bring it out to the community we didn't want even ourselves to get sick with it um, to a matter of fact, what was interesting about all of this is your shoes. I will never forget the shoes because you, if you wore shoes, you brought shoes and you could not leave with those shoes to, in the city. You had to leave your shoes behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, were they doing like the disinfecting process? I know that your hospitals were doing the UV light kind of thing. Was that happening there too? No, it wasn't happening there, but we were doing basic disinfection like we would do in a hospital. Um, we had a sanic, like a, a cleansers. We had cleansers and we had um, housekeeping there. Uh, you know what? I take that back. The, the housekeeping team, the, the um, janitorial team that worked there, when they cleaned rooms, because we had rooms, they were like little bays. Um, they would clean them very well. And then they had like these UV lights they would put on the curtain um, and then spray. So they, they, they were trawling a lot of cleaning methods and then swabbing to make sure that, you know, they took care of all the germs in there. Mm -hmm. um, so do you remember your first patient at Javits? If not, <laughs> Do you remember that first day of working, working? Uh, what was it like? So first day of working. So I had, okay, so to say my first patient is an understatement because I had like nine patients. <laughs> I didn't have just one patient. And um, we went in the first day, we were, my, my friends and I were orientated by the nurses who had worked the day before. Okay, so they only been there one day. And, um, you know, kind of showing us the rope. And um, I had more than one patient. Yeah, I had like eight patients. And, but I got to know them because I would see them every day. I would, I had the same assignment. And, um, mm -hmm. and it built continuity because you were in teams and um, until I developed a team. And our team um, eventually became uh, EMF uh, 19 was the team I was assigned to. And um, we were nurses and corpsmen on a team and we worked the night shift and then we had the EMF 19 day team. So we would relieve each other to, be, to bring continuity of care to our patients, no matter what pod, because we were in pods, uh, we were in and um, the patients knew, like if I was coming in at night, or the patients didn't know, but we knew like, if I was coming in at night, I would take over the patients that the day shift had, and then the day shift would come back the next day. They would take their patients back that they had the day prior, and that would build trust and continuity of care for a chaotic environment. Um, so back to those best practices that you were um, doing in Florida, were you able to do some of those um, at Javits? So we tried our best. 
we um, the government really didn't have a lot of wiggle room when it came to <laughs> um, ingenuity. They wanted you to use what you was there. They, um, you know, if we ran out of something, they had already ordered it. They didn't. They didn't want us to, um, you know, uh, be without supplies. Um, you know, there was a point where we did run out of basic supplies, you know, um, and every day, like you're talking about processes change, it's um, pr prior, every day the process changed, every day, you came in, it was something new, I was like, oh, today we're not going to come in through this door, today we're going to come in through this door, oh, no, no, tomorrow we're going to be doing this, and every hour it just seemed like <laughs> there was a new piece of paper, and there was um, a new process, new equipment <laughs> and you were like every day was something new every day and even every hour because one day you worked and you had minimal equipment minimal i mean you just had a bed and a chair and a table and a light in there the next day next like week you're walking in they have equipment to monitor their oxygen saturation with no in-service you're like okay and then the next day they have alarms on the computer to let you know that the patient's not doing well i mean it was like <laughs> you had to be very flexible with the every day <laughs> um so <laughs> um so what was the experience like um well how many patients would you say that you had that were of latinx descent latino patients wow um I want to say a large percent of patients, I, I, I can't give an exact number, but with about close to 2000 patients, I would say at least half were Latino. Um, there were also African American, um, there was Asian American, there were um, European uh, primary descent um, immigrant that didn't speak English. Uh, like Russian, Polish, Eastern European, um, there. So you had a major melting pot of diversity and minority disparity in the building. And how important was it for you to like, well, what was it like for them to see you there? Um, and how do you think those experiences went? You know, to be honest, it was very unfamiliar territory. Um, tensions were very high. I didn't know what to expect or what I was bringing to the table just as a clinician, just as a nurse, okay? I will say when I did walk into my Hispanic rooms, my, my patients' rooms, or I would say a lot of my minority rooms, there was an identity factor. There was a, there was a connection. Um, they couldn't see me too much because of my PPE, um, but eventually they could. <laughs> and um, I wore my name, my, my name. I had Lieutenant Martinez on my, on my uniform, on my PPE. So they knew just by the last name, I was Hispanic, okay? And then um, they would start talking and I would, if they didn't speak English, I would just start speaking to them in Spanish. And I could see they were like, oh, oh, thank goodness. Like, oh, okay, you understand, okay. Um, and even, it just brought a sense of trust immediately. I mean, to the point where my patients were calling me Nina <laughs> instead of, you know, enfermera, nurse. Um, they would say, Nina, Nina, ven aquí, come here, Nina, little girl, come here. And I, you know, most people might find that insulting, but I mean, it's a cultural, cultural custom. And um, they knew, and, and if we had to translate for our colleagues that were there that didn't speak much Spanish, but I did have friends that did, that were uh, American that, that learned Spanish. They're from Florida, South Florida, and they speak Spanish. And they did very well with them. And you would see that the, 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 the patients um, start to become comfortable in a very, um, very institutionalized building. 
because it's very institutional. It wasn't very comfortable for them. You know, it's like in a warehouse. I mean, who wants to be in a warehouse? <laughs> and they felt, um, I couldn't imagine sleeping there. I just couldn't imagine being rooted and moved there and you just have your little phone or maybe whatever it belongs you have when you walked in the hospital if they were not stolen. And um, that's all you have. And um, as things were progressing at Javits, we were getting better things for them, like for them to be comfortable in, 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 in Javits and know that we care because at first it, it just came like here, boom, everything was like fast, fast, fast. Let's get you stable. Let's get you in the room. And, and the patients were just like, it's overwhelming for them. And a lot of them even thought they were being sent there to die. And that was a wake up call for a lot of my colleagues and myself. Cause we were like, we're not, we're not here for anyone to die. <laughs> we're here to, to make you live. Mm -hmm. Did they fully, um, your Latino patients, did they fully understand, they, they thought they were going there to die, but did they fully understand their conditions or they, did they even fully understand this virus was happening? So a few of them did and didn't because they were explained when they were at their uh, main hospital um, what they had, they were told, they were told they had COVID. Um, they, they had heard about this from friends or in the news, but they didn't think like many of us they didn't think it was like, you could, it could happen to you. It can happen to me. We, they just, you know, they went to work and, um, there was a lot of, uh, knowledge deficit. I, I, I will say with my, um, with my, uh, patient population there. But um, a lot of education went into them and to explain, you know, how to prevent, how to wash hands, how to um, nutrition, um, living condition. And um, they would explain, you know, they, they would all want to tell you their story. So like I had one Dominican gentleman, <laughs> he made me chuckle because he comes in and he says, he says, oh man, this is real. <laughs> I said, yeah, this is very real. <laughs> he goes, I think this is fake. And look, I get sick. And I said, yeah, uh -huh. yes, it's real. And we need to educate about this is very real. So a lot of denial, I would say. Um, and then how did it work for, you mentioned it previously. I want to know, how did it work for people to get to Javits? Like, um, like were people just sent there right away or... Or was it a mix of like referrals and such? It was a mix. So if the reason why they were at Javits was because we were servicing the New York City County hospitals. So like Kings County, um, what was another one? Elmhurst, Woodhall. Um, the hospitals became so overpopulated so what they were doing was um, evacuating, uh, processing out patients from those hospitals to make beds for new admission, okay? And so they say, okay, you have COVID, <clears throat> you're not, you know, so severe, or, you know, you can be monitored because what, in the hospital, they were more like trying to take care of the most critical, critical, critical patients. Not that Javits, we didn't, because they were. We had an ICU. We, we, had, a, we had a full operating ICU. Um, but they, um, at the hospital, this, there was like no staff. So you couldn't give the quality care that a patient needs to recover and recuperate after something like this. Because the worst, they were over the worst part. The worst part was at the hospital, okay? But they can be sent home because they still were had COVID, were too weak, they weren't breathing well, um, they were still feverish. There was a lot of elements to them that you could not in good faith send them back home. They still needed care. So that's what Javits became was like, okay, let's take, let's take, let's take the extra people and let's put them here so that you guys can take care of the critically ill and dying um, and so that you can focus on that. Um. So, okay, I'm trying to think about where I want to go next. Um, I guess, okay, I guess what are, um, 
some of the more bizarre symptoms that you witnessed um, or things that were really out of the normal for you? Um, hold on, I have like a- That's okay. Pet barking in the background. I'm gonna kill people. Um, <laughs> Um, the bizarre symptoms. So a lot of our patients, to be honest, we didn't, to be honest, I didn't know what the symptoms were. I didn't, because again, it wasn't fully understood. So I would, we all knew it was a respiratory, like, um, a, a, um, how can I say this? It was a, uh, damage to the lungs. That's pretty much all I knew. And then it became, you know, one of those things where um, the patients were throwing blood clots. And it was very unknown why they were throwing blood clots. And so um, that was another cascade that was happening within the human body. So first their lungs were, were, were attacked, you know, and, 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 and um, we were finding out that it was almost like as if the damage were like a high mountain climber, high altitude damage in the lung, or like when someone's uh, diving underwater and they call it the bends, they have the barrel chest syndrome. We were thinking, you know, a lot of physicians were thinking that was um, one of the complications of this disease or this virus was attacking the lungs. So we were focusing on a lot of respiratory um, making sure they got oxygen. And we were um, also um, proning them a lot because it seemed like that worked. And we didn't understand why they were throwing blood clots. It was like, and people, you know, as a nurse, I thought, oh, they're throwing blood clots because they're not moving. They're kind of laid in bed. But we were getting them up. We were making them move. And they still were having clots. And it wasn't due to that. I think when we were in New York, you know, and we saw these aggressive symptoms. I mean, these were deadly. A lot of research was being done at the helm. I mean, you had doctors drawing labs, looking at everything. I mean, like no rock was unturned. Okay. And it was like, they were looking at everything that they could. Okay. And we were pushing medicine. Like we've never pushed medicine before and trying to discover what worked and didn't work. And you would hear dialogue from the physicians and nurses about, you know, steroids and anticoagulants and, um, what antibiotics are the patients receiving and the hydro, the controversial hydrochloroquine. And, um, it was amazing to be at the cutting edge of discovery because this is how, this is research. This is, unfortunately, there was no playing field. There was no, oh, hey, this drug works. Like Tamiflu works for the flu sometimes. There was none of that. So they were really discovering from the ground zero at Javits and all these hospitals in New York City. And you will see the research today come out based from that time capsule of what worked and really did work. Cause I, I saw what worked and I saw patients leave very healthy, better condition than what they came in. So um, a lot more education needs to be brought out about that. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, scrutiny, people, you know, judging, oh, that, you know, this doesn't work and that doesn't, hasn't been claimed, but we used it and, and the mortality rate was dropping. So, um, it was very fascinating to be part of a discovery like this because you don't see this and we haven't experienced a pandemic in a hundred years. Um, and it was oddly, it was eerily, it was eerily um, parallel to 1918. From the garb we wore to the methods of nursing we did um, with this odd disease process. Um, it was like a step back, like I stepped back in time. I have no other words. <laughs> um, how was it like with your group? Um, did you support each other? Um, how was that process like the solidarity building? I'm sure you, you guys are all going through this. So there's yep. something about that. What was that like too? So we were called EMF 19 and um, we were sisters. We were a sisterhood. Every day I walked to work with my sisters and we just talked and we would change. And it was like, we walked in together. We would take care of our patients. Um, we go home together, you know, um, you have to have a strong support system. 
And um, I remember one nurse in particular, um, uh, Lieutenant Commander Walton, she says one night, she goes, we were talking and she says, you know, this is not greater than Psalms 91. I said, what? She goes, there's a book. I want you to get it. And you can't get this book, by the way. This is a military issued book only for the military. And she goes, well, you, you know, you might have to try finding it. And I said, okay. And she goes, um, she goes, if you ever read about every battle and how people survive from battles, these freakish, terrible battles, she goes, they all prayed and they all used Psalms 91. I will walk through the shadow of death. And I said, wow, that's powerful. To the point where she converted, she was so funny. She says, EMF 19 is greater than COVID-19. And that was our everyday outlook. We are greater than this. And we had a great support system. And there was not a day that I didn't have a dry eye sometimes with my sisters. Um, but there was also good times. We had a lot of good times, you know? You had to find humor in the madness. Um, healthcare providers do a good job. You asked about coping, full circle around that. You know, healthcare providers, you have to find light at the end of the tunnel because you can't always just, it, it's so sad and gruel that you have to find joy and peace within the darkness, you know? And um, there were times we would talk about our kids or funny things, you know, we would use humor or, um, <laughs> They all thought I was comical with my, you know, making patients get up and move and exercise or, you know, they're like, Martinez, you're so funny. You're making them get up. Are you and giving them the medication? I said, yeah, they got to get up, deep cough, deep, deep breathe. And my patients wouldn't want to do it. And I'd get in there. So no, you're going to do that. The, the firm nurse would be in there. And, um, and I would have patients who, you know, they were, they were a little challenging and, um, but you had to be a, a strong nurse and you say, no, you're going to get up. You're going to live today. We're going to do this. <laughs> my, my, other, my other teammates would say, oh my gosh, thank goodness. You're, you're strong to be dealing with that patient. I said, oh, well, I'm a nurse and the nurse says what the nurse says, the nurse go, goes. Okay. I said, so I'm the nurse. <laughs> That's really great. Um, how many people were in your, in that team? I didn't ask. So night shift, there was, let me see, one, two, three, four. There was four of us on night and EMF 19 and then EMF 18 had two nurses. So um, because there wasn't many nurses, they would try to team build uh, two nurses with like four corpsmen. And the two nurses would divide the pod and the pod would have like 24 patients or more. And so that'd be 12 patients per nurse. And then um, the corpsman would help to take care of a patient if it was vital signs, um, helping to administer medication, um, bathe patients, um, help with the nurse getting the patient up. So um, it was a very, very busy, busy, busy time. But then, you know, we were able to come in um, I was a periop nurse, so um, I work in the operating room. I don't, um, I don't work in the specialty of um, medical surgical nursing, but because there wasn't enough medical surgical nurses or ICU nurses, a nurse is a nurse, a doctor is a doctor in this crisis. So we had to up tempo quickly. I worked this kind of nursing 20 years ago. It's not that I forgot, it's just I'm a little rusty, but I got there, you know? And so, um, because we had to help the nurses, we had to help the team, there was just not enough. There was just not enough. So um, yeah, most of the teams used to have four nurses working and about four or five corpsmen so that they can help again with the day-to-day, -day, bring patients to the bathroom, showers, um, feeding, phone calls, you know? Was it just um, deployed service members at Javits or were there other healthcare workers that joined with y'all? In the beginning, it was just the military. And then slowly we started getting physicians from the county hospitals starting to help um, because we needed their expertise. Um, some of these patients were very complex that they knew 
um, what resources were in New York City um, to help their patients. And they loved working with that. I love, they were just so happy to be there. Um, we slowly started uh, gaining civilian nurses, nurses in the community. A lot of these nurses came from um, upstate New York, um, from nursing homes. A lot of them came from some of the uh, hospitals in the area that just were looking for um, extra um, pay or just to help because they saw an advertisement. Um, I think FEMA had, someone had put an advertisement for Javits or this mission. And they, they knew because I asked, I said, how did you know? And they said, oh, we saw a job and it was to help the military and we want to be here. And I just think it's so awesome what you guys are doing. And I'm thinking, I find it funny that you want to help us. We're helping you, you know, like I thought it was very noble. I thought it was awesome that we brought a positive um, uh, impact. We, we, we positively impacted New York City where we had citizens come and answer the call and say, I want to help the military. So it was nice. Mm -hmm. um, so at your peak, how many patients would you say the Javis Center held? Uh, close to 2,000. We didn't fully full, but it was like close to 2,000 patients at the peak. And when did the trend start slowing down? When did you just start seeing that, all right, we're not getting this many people every day? Um, <laughs> I swear that took a while. <laughs> um, it took a while to see that number, but all of a sudden, I would say it was towards the end of April, we started to see a decline in admissions. Um, it was like, it just, it was weird because I swear the first week we got there, it was like, we had these open pods and, and as nurses were coming, the ambulances were bringing in the patients and they were just like, you know, you would hear the two-way radio and you would have like three patients admit at the same time. And the doctors are like trying to grab the paperwork, trying to admit them, and you're trying to get their vitals. Um, and then that slowly was slowing down because we were full. Some of the pods were so full, we didn't have space. And then, um, um, and then the hospitals were starting to retain their patients a little bit more. Like it almost like it was a balancing act. Um, so we started to see a decline around the end of April um, because it was like, oh my God, is the peak flattening out? I was like, wow, you can actually see it in the admissions going down. And Cuomo alluded to that. We'd watch his news conference and he's like, we're hitting the, we're hitting the flat, we're, we're peaking, we're, we're flatlining out. And I'm like, oh, but you could see it in the hospitals because people weren't coming in as much. Um, so it was, it was true data that was being reported from the team, from Cuomo and what we're seeing in the hospitals. It was actually very interesting because they had to report that information, I think, daily. So um, great communication. Um, and so when, when did you leave? Like, when were you finished with your deployment? Or when did they end? I don't know the terminology, but when did they end it? So Javits ended up closing around the first week of May. Um, but we were still there um, to wrap things up, to be on standby. Um, because we still had we still had military in the campuses, like at Bellevue, uh, uh, Bronx. Um, we still had military there up until end of May. They were still in those hospitals for the staffing needs um, so that we didn't leave New York completely unstaffed um, until the staff members came back from being sick or the travelers can come back or they can hire whatever was the circumstance but yeah the the mission um finished around end of may beginning of june um and what was the process of leaving like um for you for your team um the process was interesting because we had to be on lockdown and then they had to test us to make sure we were not COVID positive. We didn't have it, we weren't gonna spread it. So we had to get tested numerous times and um, we had to be quarantined. And I swear we were quarantined before we left as well <clears throat> to because we were like, you're talking about moving people like cluster grapes. So you have a high risk of getting sick and they didn't want that to keep going around. So um, once we left New York City, my group, we left uh, to, we flew in a private plane, military flight, 
to Florida and we, we quarantined in Jacksonville um, for 14 days because in order, that was across the, the board, no matter where you left, you were automatically on quarantine. And then once we came close to our 14th day, we were retested to make sure we were not again positive because if you did come back positive, you had to stay an additional 14 days or until testing was negative. So the government was very um, responsible to the fact that we were coming back to a community. Some of us were coming back to a community that didn't have any COVID cases. So you had to be very uh, responsible and accountable for introducing this member back in the community. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they did a pretty good job with that. Um, exactly. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you came back to Florida in May, you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you came back, um, what was it like to come back and see your kids again after, you know, the quarantining? Um, and was your husband finished at that point? No. So let me tell you, my per it was very weird to come back home. I was only gone for, what, 50 days or maybe if that, I don't even remember, <laughs> um, two months, but so in New York, you were wearing a mask everywhere you went. When I came back to Florida, people weren't wearing masks and it was very culture shock for me because I'm thinking to myself, oh my, like I just came back from a pretty hellish ride here and this isn't over and there's still cases climbing in Florida. Florida now when I had her, because I still was talking to my friends and they were like, oh my God, this nursing home down the street, we had all these admissions and it was still spreading. And to see my hometown or my home state not complying with a, a mask, it was very bizarre to me. To the point where I had a fear coming home because it was like, I don't want to catch it. I just literally left an epicenter not catching this. <laughs> And I'm going to wear a mask. And people were looking at me like I was crazy wearing a mask. And, and my, even, my, you know, they're like, but, but you don't have, I was like, I don't want to catch it. I don't want to, you know, spread it. What if I'm a carrier? Um, just being responsible. But, um, you know, and I went to go visit my husband in Fort Myers and it was the same culture. Like people, they were opening, Florida was reopening. That was another thing. So when I came back to Jacksonville, Florida was reopening. So, um, here you go. And it was like people, restaurants, no mask. And I'm walking around with masks. People are looking at me like I was crazy. And my husband's like, well, you know, you don't have to. I said, well, I think it's a social responsibility more than if you don't have to. But, um, and then I came home with my kids and of course they've been locked in the house. They've been gone out, you know, and it was a very um, supportive, welcoming. My neighbors, you know, they put a banner together. They were all um, very happy to see they cooked dinner for me for a whole week. Um, just, they were very supportive. The community was very supportive of my kids and my family. So it was, it was nice. Yeah. Um Okay, since you mentioned that about the mask, how did you go about explaining this process to people? And, and what was it like for people to actually not believe that this was still happening? So <laughs> every person I run into, you know, and I'll wear a mask and they look at me and I'm like, you know, you really should wear a mask, you know? And I'm, I, I know, you know, first thing I, was, you know, I, I came from New York, I was deployed in New York, they're like, oh, you were? And I, I have no problem sharing that because this is a public health problem. And um, so that I have people asking me, they're like, wow. So um, obviously they're like, what, what, you were there. You, you know, what was it like? You know, I, I trust you. You have credibility because you were there. You saw it. And I go, yeah, but even if I wasn't there as a healthcare provider, being in the community, you really should heed warning to what the public statues are right now. Um, but it's funny because when I tell people that I was deployed to New York with the Navy, they're like, oh, oh yeah. So should I wear a mask when I go to the store? I'm like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So a lot of education, um, that is our duty, really, as, as, as service members. Really serving is to serve the community as well. So um, educating is a big, big, big thing that we've been doing. And, and the military has been, you know, very supportive of educating, reaching out you know, talk, telling our story because 
this was very real. I, this was not, this was, this was not media um, made. This was, this was real. <laughs> um, so did you, so you still went out when you came back? You still went places. And, and what was it like for you to leave or go places? Was that um, hard for you to do that in the beginning? It was. I, I'm going to be honest, like, I went out, I mean, I would really when I go out, I just go to a store grocery shopping. But um, to this point, no, I don't. I have everything delivered. I was used to like Instacart was my best friend. And um, um, whatever, door dashing it. And my kids never had that lifestyle. So it's so funny. The first time I door dashed McDonald's, I know McDonald's is terrible, but um, they were like, wow, someone delivers McDonald's. Can you do that again? I'm like, no, we're not doing that again. It was only one time thing, you know, but um, yeah, it's, it was, it, I, I try not to go to a lot of places. And if I do, I do a lot of, um, you know, I stay my distance, wear my mask. My kids have their masks. Um, it, no, it, it is, uh, you know, you try to educate, show by example, because <laughs> cases keep going up. And are you back at work now in your original yeah. hospital? Mm -hmm. And how has that been? Um, have protocols changed again? Uh, how are people adapting? You know, the, my poor health system. So they were dealing with this back in March and then the numbers went down um, because everything was completely shut down. Then as the state opened up, things are obviously increasingly uh, rising pretty fast. Um, they, are, they have a pretty good handle on the health system of trying not to get it, not have it overwhelmed. So I have to say they're doing a really good job of being on top of it um, from the health care standpoint of, of supplies and, and, and hospital beds and things like that. Um, community wise, I don't, I don't know um why the numbers keep going up but they do um what about the latino population where you are how have you seen how it's been affecting them in particular yes so <clears throat> similar to new york city okay so if you look at the map um if you trend what's happening in florida some of the heavier hit counties are um, a lot more Hispanic per population percentage. And um, to the point where my mother-in-law just reached out to me and, and she says, you know, her family friend has a friend at one of the, my hospital campuses. If I can reach out, I said, I cannot, you know, and, um, you know, and, and um, it is a heavily dense um, Hispanic population in certain parts of the county here. And um, I, I would say a physician may know how to answer that question as to why from a disease process, but from a cultural socioeconomic standpoint as a nurse um, and identifying with the Latino community. We are a unique culture where we um, tend to be housed with many generations in our home. We are very social beings. We are um, social as in like hugging, you know, kissing the cheek, you know, touching everyone, you know, um, cooking, having people over your house, um, alcohol, if there is or not, you know, that's a question, but uh, we are very social creatures and we like to be out and have, you know, a good time. And, I, and I'm not saying that's every Hispanic or Latino, I'm just, you know, for the most part, or it's, we're the essential worker, where we are the ones out working, we're the ones driving the bus, we're the ones in the grocery store, we're the ones in the hospital, we're the ones that have to work to make ends meet. And so we're driving the buses, getting exposed, um, we have to work. Hence, this is also why you're seeing this population spike in numbers. Um, and it's not just partying, it's also working. Um, and it's the one, you know, it's the kid working that brings it home. And maybe there's three generations living in the house and everyone gets it or they just get it. Or, um, 
you know, they get it, they live, but everyone gets it and dies in the house or they all get it and um, they all die. I mean, it is just the, the most bizarre disease that you'll ever see. And you hear these stories and I have asked a lot of my patients and looking into their living, you know, what their nutrition is as well, like the whole picture, because as a nurse, I look at, you have to look at the entire picture. It's not just your income. It is your nutrition. It is your living. It is, you know, where do you go to shop? It is the whole entire gamut. Where do you pray? Do you go to church? What do you do? What is the entire um, psychosocial well-being of the individual? And it's interesting because a lot of my patients um, were very, um, very ill-informed about uh, vitamins, uh, nutrition, the foods they should be eating uh, to control uh, their hypertension, to control their uh, uh, weight, um, food selection, the processed food, the food they can only afford. Um, the, the 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 living condition they can only afford to live in and so it it, it, it is it is very eye-opening when you start peeling back the layers of the hispanic community and it's and, and of course as, as latinos we come in an array of colors right we have the afro-american all the way to the tahino indian to the mayan indian depending on where you are from and all those um elements within ourselves plays a big factor in how we are going to respond to treatment of care and medication. We are a unique people on that end. So there may be some medications that the patient population, depending on where they're from, Eastern European may respond one way, but the Latino uh, Hispanic patient may not respond that way based on what is the descendancy of this individual. And you have to take that into account when dealing with uh, cultural diversity in patient care um, and be very sensitive to it. And a lot of my colleagues that were from multicultural backgrounds understood that picture, understood the story of the essential worker, of the immigrant coming to have to work to pay their bills, but they're exposing themselves to this virus. And what about the folks that weren't so sensitive to that what what was it like having to maybe educate them if you did that or not we did you know um i wa i worked alongside some of the best people i some of the best very open-minded individuals very sensitive to what the clinical picture was in front of us and um those that didn't know, because maybe they lived in an area where this is not a prominent community, a prominent culture, were open to understanding. I didn't run into resistance on that end, I have to tell you, because as a healthcare provider, it's humanity first. It's humanity first. So everyone was there to help, and how they could help was to learn. So we all were learning. We all were learning. Um, how have, so the pandemic is happening, but there are also countless social movements happening at the same time. How has it been for you to, like, how has that maybe impacted your daily life or, um, how does it weigh on your conscious if it does at all? Um, it hasn't impacted my daily life. Um, I still serve this nation with integrity. I um, believe that things work for a certain way, but um, I believe in what is right for this country and whatever is the pathway it takes, it takes, I have to support the decision that's taken as an officer in the military, you support the constitution and you support the nation and whatever way it goes, you must support. So um, that's pretty much my take on all this, whatever pathway it takes, it takes. Um, okay. I 
don't think I have any more questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to share or something you did mention or something you want to say? I wanted to say, I wanted to put in a powerful message from a patient that um, had talked to me while I was there. Um, and this was after Easter and I will never forget this. As a matter of fact, this was something I was going to try to open with. Um, hold on, excuse me one second. Go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, one thing I want to leave everyone with is um, even though like the situation was very um, chaotic and dark and um, very scary, I, I had a patient tell me, and, and this is something I will never forget, I was sharing with my friends, my sisters. So the patient tells me, because they all wanted to talk to you, like they all wanted to tell you their story and I, and I would listen to their story. And one in particular, I just remember sometimes always feeling defeated when I came into work because it's just overwhelming, psychologically overwhelming <laughs> and very sad and you're trying to help. Um, and one patient tells me in her, in her, um, gasping breath she was she was having a hard time talking and breathing and but she had to talk to me about this she had to tell me and uh she wouldn't stop and so she says no i have to tell you something it's okay <clears throat> and she says you know um i was dying in long island in a hospital out there and um i was on a ventilator and she said my body hurts so bad it hurts so bad and i was praying to, she was, I was praying to God and, um, she says, he can't, you know, she says, oh my God, please take me. My, my body hurts so much. I cannot do this fight anymore. I cannot do this. I can't do this. And she says, you know, El Señor came to her and told her, no, it's not your time. It's not your time to come with me. And she said, she's with the pain. So he took her pain away. She felt this warmth through her body. And I'm listening to this woman, you know, when I hear patients telling me these things, you listen. And she says, you know, all of a sudden my body felt warm and the pain was going away. And I said, wow. And she goes, Nina, she goes, Nina, you, you have an angel protecting you. The spirit is protecting. El Señor told me, uh, and between gasping breaths, everyone in this building, that has been working to help in his name will not be touched by this disease. And the ones who had worked there, working in that hospital, all tested negative for COVID-19. So there was a lot of element to this situation, whatever it is you believe in, I'm not gonna go into that but it made you open your eyes to what is really happening and um, the community, what was happening within the community as well. And listening to the stories of New Yorkers, of the adversities they were having, even as Chinese American, when I had my uh, China, you know, Asian American patients and they would tell me their perspective of how they were treated in the community. It broke my heart. Um, we were there to just make them get better. And um, they were very receptive. I say they, the, the citizens of New York, our patients were, were pretty content. They were, they were happy, um, even though they were in a warehouse, but um, we try to make the best of the situation for them. <clears throat> and um, while I was there in New York, I was recognized with um, a DAISY Award, which is one of the highest awards you can receive in nursing for patient care. And what I received it for was from um, the Army, was for creating a positive environment of uniting two sisters together while I was there. 
And it was just through listening to my patients. Um, the patient was, you know, telling me that she had a sister that was hospitalized too, had texted her because everything's through text message. And I said, you have a sister. She says, yes, she thinks she's here. This is Javis. I said, yeah. And she says, my sister's name is, you know, so-and-so. I said, okay, very common, by the way, name. <laughs> and I said, okay, there's like 2000 people here. Okay, let me figure this out. Cause this is not like a regular hospital where I can like go on a computer and find you in the database, no problem. Get the nurse who's taking care of you. This is like a warehouse at Costco's and you have to go through the aisles and we don't have a registry with like, um, like there's no, there's a registry, but because there's patient identification, we only use first initial and last name initial. So you can have the same, you know? So when I went there to um, look, I went to the pre-admission, the, the, the patient um, admission area. I said, hey, do we have a patient with these initials? And of course, <laughs> they, they were like, yeah, we, we have about 15. I'm like, okay, okay. And they're all in different areas. Now, I'm not, I don't know how familiar anyone is with Javits, but it's huge. It is a huge conference center. And I think I did like 30,000 steps that night looking for the sister. Mm -hmm. And finally, I found the sister was my last patient. And how I ruled it out was like, literally, I would just go by wherever the room number was with that initial. And just, if it was a guy, obviously, it wasn't the patient. And, um, and finally, I found the patient was my, my last patient. And she was on the army side. And I walked in the room and I said, hi, um, you know, do you have a sister named so-and-so? She goes, yes. I said, your sister, your sister's here. And she goes, yes. And um, this sister was in better health, <clears throat> a little bit better health where she can get up and walk than her sister I was taking care of. I said, well, do you want to come with me? And do you want to see your sister? She says, oh my God, yes. Lily like springs out of her cot and she's like mid stride, almost running to go to her sister. I'm like, you don't have to run. <laughs> I was like, we'll get there. I can get a wheelchair to push you. And um, when they got to the rooms together to see the sisters together, I had to like walk away because I was like, you know, I, I was crying where I couldn't even breathe through my mask. <laughs> and um, they they were crying so much like okay okay we got to calm down because like if we cry too much and too hard you're gonna um de de deoxygenate <laughs> and you know they were they were laughing and and i said we gotta take it easy <laughs> and to see the reunion and i said okay well i had um in my pod i had um two extra beds but there was a, one open across the, the hallway from the sister but that wasn't my area and so I said, well, let me see if I can bring the sister under my care, even though I have like a full load. So I went to the army side and I, I said, listen, um, your patient in this room, it happens to be a relative of mine, of one of my patients, I'm going to move her. I didn't even give him an option. I said, I'm going to move her and she's going to go to my area. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> they looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, who's going to take another patient? I said, well, they're sisters and they need to be together. If I have to take her bed and push it in the other sister's room, I would. I mean, I would have done that, you know, but I couldn't. And they were like, okay, I said, I just need someone to help gather her things and I will assume all responsibility, all her care, her charges, give me it all. And they were just like, I mean, they were like still kind of confused with all this. <laughs> and, um, and then the sisters were put together and they got better together. They would always visit. They were, they were really cute. Um, and so when I got back to my team, you know, and I said, okay, we have sisters on our unit. They're like, what sisters? And um, so the goal was every time whoever took care of the sisters had to have the same nurse. I said, so um, even though they were like in odd rooms, I said, okay, but if you take care of this patient, you assume the sister. So... <laughs> So that it was one nurse, one standard of care, because I'm telling you, one sister would want orange juice and so did the other one. They were, you know, siblings, siblings. And so I just took what my, 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 my reason for it. I mean, I would have, I would do, I would want this done if this was me. 
if this were me and, and I had a family member and I was in a really, really, really bad situation like that, I would want someone to do the same for me. And that's, that's my moral compass. I do for others as I would want done for me. And so, you know, to, to have that, it was like, oh man, this is, this is making the situation a little bit better, you know? And, um, it brought up such morale, even throughout the whole building, because I ended up writing about it and people were just like, oh, oh you know, like, wow, we did something great, even though we were doing great things, but we did something even more powerful of uniting family. And, and because the stories were so sad, the stories were just, I mean, they were coming in and they would be like cold stone because they came in with their, their wife or their mom and their brother and mom and brother died and they were the lone survivor or they came in with the wife and the wife died and it's their birthday. I mean, it was just something hard to wrap your head around. And now they're gonna have to go home and pick up these pieces. And that was very challenging. Because it's not just, it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's, it's inhumane. It was sad. They lost everything. That's so beautiful that you did that. Like that, that made me a little bit emotional because I'm thinking about that if I were in that situation, I would want someone to, like, I would need my sister <laughs> or someone because it's, it's scary. Well, congratulations <laughs> for on that award. Um, even though these circumstances are inhumane, like you're saying, <laughs> but it's, it's, we're here. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to mention? No, um, not really. Other than the, the presence that, um, the positive presence that the military tried to maintain and um, the level of care. I mean, they, they, it was really, I can't speak, this is my first mission I had with the military in the United States like this. And I have to tell you, it was just a positive one. People went with their manners. People, we, we came to take care of our people. Like there was no judgment. There was no, uh, that's not my job. <laughs> there was none of that. It was everybody's job. Even if it was a physician having to fold towels. Um, it was very humbling. So I, I hope New Yorkers, and I hope our country looks at the military in a positive light because that's all they came to do was to help. And, um, and they all had good hearts and good intentions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your service first. <laughs> um, and I think the military, I come from a military family as well. I don't know if I shared that with you, but um, my grandfather was in the Vietnam War and my uncle was in both Gulf Wars. Um, so it's a big deal for us too. Um, and it's a legacy too. It's not just Vietnam War. I think it goes back Korean War and then World War II as well. So everyone is there. Um, and it is important. It's, it's different. It's just, it's a different lifestyle, but it's what we rely on and this is what got us here this far right like we exist because of sacrifices um so that's important to remember um, it is but, i have to say like when i was even there it was funny because i can t sense the hesitancy with a lot of the patients being military but being you know hispanic it was easy for them to accept me because i'm like oh i'm in the navy like oh and they were just so cute about it and they, and they were very proud and um and and that means a lot to me because that's what we're trying to achieve as people and um it was i was like yeah they go wow you have a family you're awesome you're in the military i said yes yes and um and and bonding with my patients and 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 or they would hear stories from other patients that didn't they were english speaking they said my grand my dad was in the navy or my dad was in the army he used to fly planes and i'm like oh that's awesome so as a minority, when I would see my patients that were minorities, like my friends and I would come in, they would just embrace us immediately. And then we're just like so proud of like, I think we represent 
um, pry. Um, we break the we break the glass ceiling as women coming in as uh, minority women and showing that we can do this, and that's a big deal because um, there wasn't many Hispanics serving in the military, but we were very strong in the presence we gave our community, and um, I hope that 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 leaves an impression in our future for the future because we have to have a vital part in our in our country. I, I think it definitely gives hope too. It's a mm -hmm. good one. Well, I'm officially out of questions. <laughs> um, again, if there's anything else you'd like to share, please you can. Um, but um, this was an amazing interview and I, I really thank you for giving us your time and for giving us your story um, and for sharing so much about something that I know is, is still tough and people are still processing. But Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you for the time and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I will um, forward you um, when this gets posted, I, I'll be sure to send you a link. Um, and then um, whenever it's posted on our a site or at the archives, I'll be sure to send that over to you too. Or um, I'm not sure if they'll be in contact with you as well, but I'll make sure to be in contact with you. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Thank you again so much for real, for your service, for this interview, for it all, for being an inspiration, for just, just there's a lot. It's different. I don't know. I feel weird, but I, I truly am like super grateful. Um, but that's it for me. Um, and that can be the end of the interview if you'd like. Yes, awesome. All right, well, keep me posted and I look forward to hearing from you, Ezekiel. All righty, you too. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.